and I'm glad that um, Hiroko was presenting about the workout this morning because I can, I'm picking up uh, where she left off uh, and, and the, the, the story about the causing her is actually is about how and what the workout eventually became uh, one or two centuries later. Uh, so the, the, um, the, the rise and fall of causing her is the um, subtitle of the paper. The title of the paper is Tributary System in Maritime Capitalism in Early Modern East Asia. And theoretically, what I want to uh, address is this. Uh, I'm not a big fan of Andrew Gunnar Frank, who believe everything is a big war system ever since I don't know when. But uh, I, I'm more a believer in the kind of a Wallastinian, Aurigian conception that, uh, and also I think uh, Chris is closer to that as well. So this kind of a, uh, 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 European or central um, network and European centered capitalist system that historically expand and incorporate uh, long Western uh, areas like East Asia and China into the system uh, uh, first as external arena. So it is a uh, concept from Polanyi and from uh, from Wallerstein that these uh, trading networks full ports of trade uh, that link up um, India, China and all, all other kind of uh, areas to be trading with the European world economy but the production and social structure of these on Western places is not yet be structured uh, until they are fully incorporated uh, into the uh, capitalist world system in the 19th century and later. Um, so this is the story that I'm, uh, I'm, I agree with how it actually happened, but uh, there's kind of a, of course, there's a critique of what's seen as uh, being Eurocentric and seeing this expansion, expansion as a theological and unilinear um, process in which the prime mover of the incorporation process is always um, the European companies and so on and so forth, and this one European people are the people with the history that passively uh, get drawn into the system. So what I want to look at is the, to look at the actual actors involved in this incorporation process and the contingency involved. Nothing is inevitable. Uh, all of us are very familiar with um, the Zhang He story, that the Zhang He expedition uh, ended uh, in the um, uh, in the 1430s, that is the early 15th century. After that, so the, the maritime space uh, of uh, Asia would, was become a kind of vacuum. Then the standard story is that it was a vacuum, and then later the European came and then take over this space and then uh, in the established trading posts in the Batavia, which is today's um, uh, is down there. That's uh, uh, the Java, Jakarta. Um, and, uh, and of course, there's Malacca, which is close to today's Singapore, but by, by the Portuguese, uh, and then taken over by the British, and, uh, and then Portuguese in Macau, uh, actually the, the Dutch in the Taiwan in the 1620s. So, so it is this standard story of how Asia gets drawn into um, uh, the European world system because of this vacuum left by Zhang He. But actually what happened is that, as Hiroko pointed out, that there's um, not that unilinear and direct because uh, this Maritime space of Asia is not exactly vacuum. There was this vocal, uh, maybe the, 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 the Inland Empire called them pirates, but actually they armed the trading networks uh, running around there. And then uh, they are a lot decentralized. And over the centuries, from the 15th century all the way to the 17th century, actually they centralized into something very mighty uh, that managed to kick out the Dutch from Taiwan, as the Kozinga story is about, and then monopolized the, the trade in whole maritime Asia. Um, so uh, how these things played out, how these uh, trading networks interact with uh, Europeans is a fascinating story. Um, the, what we know about the, the international order of Asia um, in the early Poland period is uh, probably uh, the, the most influential uh, uh, scholar is Takashi Hamashita and also David Kahn talk about this tributary system. Um, but actually by 16th century that this tributary system the Sino-Centric Triple Trade System has been collapsing already. That uh, um, um, Japan already want to actually uh, displace China's uh, the central place <coughs> in this system, uh, as um, shown indicated by the 1590s Hideyoshi invasion of Korea, and then the main uh, dynasty sent an army to expel them with great causes, and also this um, and Cambodia. Um, and many Southeast Asian states also uh, starting to be centralized and start to compete with China to become a kind of a mini tribal center. So this kind of Sino-centric uh, 
triple trace system actually is crumbled in the 16th century. And then in, the, uh, in that period, this Volko and then the pirate or trading networks emerge. Um, and they are not quite pirates because the, 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 um, the emperor uh, in Beijing uh, was uh, very worried about all these uh, coastal people going out of the train and they uh, out of reach of the control of the empire. So they basically keep writing stuff and to uh, kind of paint them as uh, brutal looters and, and bad people and red women and things like that. But actually you look at the record, First, they are not that bad. Actually, they are doing trade. They are, uh, uh, so there's a lot of armed conflict because the main uh, levy worry about them and pursue them, and then got uh, they fought back. Uh, and also, the European at that time already there. The Portuguese is in um, Macau, and the Dutch was around, and the Spaniards were in Manila already. So they uh, these uh, uh, the trading um, people. Uh, have been uh, purchasing the weapons from the Europeans, so they have uh, uh, firearms already. Uh, so there's a lot of this kind of a local war between these traders and, and the main levy. Uh, uh, and at the same time, the, the, the official orthodox uh, main or Chinese history is saying that they are all Japanese, but actually they are a lot Japanese. There's a mixed group of Japanese, Chinese, and uh, probably also Korean as well. Um, and the uh, Kozinga, uh, or the, the Zhang Tengkong family, that is the, the, the family history illustrated is because um, his family's fortune as a, one of the biggest and later unified all these uh, uh, the pirates and traders into one uh, trading uh, corporations uh, that uh, uh, the father, the founding father of that family is Zhang Jilong, uh, was actually a Fujianese Chinese, but uh, he has a trading post in Nagasaki, Japan, um, and um, is married a Japanese. Uh, so Gozinga's mother is Japanese, and Zhang Jilong at that time in Nagasaki also get baptized by the Portuguese, and then so he adopted a Christian name, and he was alternatively known in the European records at re record as uh, Nicholas Ikuan. Um, Ikuan is uh, is actually the the the. the um, um, it's from the Chinese word Yi Guan, it's kind of a headman or whatever, that's just Nicholas. Um, so this, um, this, uh, the, this is important because uh, as Andrew Gunnar Frank is right, and uh, the Ken Pomerance and everybody else talking about it, silver is right, because uh, what is, is actually driving the transformation of the Chinese empire and actually el elsewhere is that uh, before the discovery of American silver and the massive um, uh, inflow of silver into this old world, uh, this uh, commercialization and centralization of the bureaucracy uh, reach a limit because uh, they run into the problem of not having adequate uh, store of values. Uh, and until the massive inflow of American silver, in the case of China, is full of, uh, Fili uh, full of Philippines, full of Spaniards uh, in Manila. And, but before that, they, there's a lot of uh, silver from Japan as well, but uh, it ended in the 1630s when Japan uh, put uh, the seclusion policy to stop silver flowing into China. But all these kind of uh, uh, trading networks are important and they are mingling with the Europeans uh, to, 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 to export Chinese goods, uh, ceramic, silk, and et cetera, et cetera, and import American silver into the uh, Ming Empire. And the whole um, Ming Empire de depend on silver uh, uh, because uh, by the 1580s, they already shift the whole tax base of the empire to silver. Uh, everybody paid tax in silver, and then all bulk good was traded in silver, but there was not much silver in China, so it, it really depend on foreign trade to get all this silver that to fuel the commercial economy and the centralization of the state. Uh, and then the silver was brought by this trading level. So there's a kind of a mess out there that who is controlling the trade among the Hoko, the, the, uh, the Zhang family, and then the Europeans. What is um, Interesting is that these kind of trading networks, Zhang Jilong was just a trader, and later get incorporated by the Ming Levy, uh, serving the Ming uh, dynasty. But that uh, in 1644, the Manchus uh, invaded and uh, wiped out the Ming dynasty and established the Qing dynasty. And then uh, Zhang Jilong was arrested and then put in uh, custody in Beijing and then died there. And then his son moved on to continue the business of. Uh, of, um, of his father, uh, and then uh, what he did is uh, uh, much uh, much way forward than what his father did. His father just unified all these uh, trading networks under um, his leadership, and uh, uh, he's controlling the, the ports uh, in the Fujian area, so this control all the export of Chinese goods and import of silver. 
uh, while the Europeans are still uh, uh, doing a lot of trade and then going to the area to do trade with Zhang Jilong. And what his son, Zhang Chenggong, which is the, also known as causing guy in European literature, did is to turn this whole maritime level of trade into a kind of mercantilist uh, state. So it is state building going on. And uh, originally it was in Fujian area. Um, later, of course, when the Qing army moved south, tried to crush him, and then he left and uh, went to Taiwan. And then at that time, the Dutch was in Taiwan in Zealandia. And then they kicked them out, uh, outnumbered them, and then um, and you go to Thailand today, you still see the Asian battlefield with uh, the tombstone of all these the Dutch and the Chinese in that battle over there. And um, so they established a kind of a state in Taiwan. And then while the mainland was uh, the Qing Empire, and uh, the paper is available on the website, you can take a look at it. And Basically, what uh, Zhang Jilong did was to uh, create a vertically integrated enterprise, like after the VOC, and then not only the firearms, but also the organization form of the VOC, and then um, uh, start to really um, um, monopolize the trade, not only uh, in this area where the silver came in and the goods uh, going out, but also monopolize all the trade routes uh, to the European outposts in the Southeast Asia and to Manila. Uh, by uh, forcing all the whatever whoever trading this route has to pay tax uh, to uh, the Chang family and then to raise the fact if uh, when and they have enough firepower to attack and uh, sink any ship that is spot moving around what lot raising the fact that is they don't they didn't pay tax so basically it is a maritime mercantile State and then it's very interesting that um, after they kick out uh, the Dutch, and the last Dutch governor of Taiwan uh, wrote that I led me to is a fascinating paragraph, um, and the Dutch uh, was saying that basically what uh, Zhang Jilong was doing is like what the Dutch has been doing to the Span Spanish Empire. <laughs> basically, the Qing is the Spanish and a continental empire. Um, uh, and then uh, the Dutch, of course, gained independence uh, after the revolution in the late 16th century and then the 30th years war uh, defeat the Spanish Empire. And then right after the Dutch was kicked out of Taiwan, the last governor, um, Koyat, Frederick Koyat, saying that, um, I, I read the quote of that Dutch the, the, um, official there about the Zhang Jilong, uh, Zhang, Zhang Chenggong, is when in the previous century, our beloved fatherland, that is the Netherlands, had fallen into such extremity that it seemed no longer possible to resist the power of the Spaniards, and when the church had to all appearance become their slaves and highly celebrated the prince, the greatest politician of the time, whose memory is so dear to the Dutch nation, and on whose um, martyrdom the first foundation of our precious freedom was laid, were laid, forced the desperate council to surrender the country to the mercy of the waters by breaking the dews and dams, thus causing it to sing away as if in a, a principle and compelling the people with their wives, children, and movable property to take refuge in their ships. They would then have to depend absolutely on God's mercy and go to sea in search of other countries where they could found a little republic, which is the, the Dutch Republic. In like manner, Kozinger, after many long years of war with the Tatars, that is the Manchus, who pursued him very vigorously, was brought to a state of great extremity, so much so that he has forced the to hide his wife and children and all their movable goods in junks and to remove from one island to another. When all Qing forces joined together against him, success um, forsook him for a time and he was compelled to seek his fortune at sea. Here his influence would increase as much as power on land decreased, especially because the Tatars had little experience of sea life. So it is the rise of a maritime empire. Uh, and actually, and then after they established themselves in Taiwan in the 1660s, and managed to control all the trade route in all of Asia. And at that time, the, the English uh, was the newcomer. And then uh, when they went to the Asia, start the Asia trade, basically they established a little trade post in tai Taiwan to trade with uh, Zhang Chenggong. And then uh, the, 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 and in terms of revenue that uh, I have data in the, in, in the paper, that actually uh, the total uh, reserve of the Zhang regime was 100 million and actually it is uh, uh, half of the total surface of the Qing Empire state uh, and um, uh, double um, the, the surface of the Dutch East, East, uh, VOC operation in um, Batavia. So it is huge in size and it's very organized in organization and they monopolize, they have also all these kind of smuggling networks 
from all the way to mainland inland China to smuggle goods from China to Taiwan and then uh, ship it to uh, the European outposts in Southeast Asia. And at that time, so, so it is how China was, or uh, the East Asia was incorporated into the European system, not subjugated by European forces, but uh, it's kind of equal partners and equal players um, kind of mode. Uh, but at that time, that the Jiang family was torn between two uh, options. One option is that uh, whether they want to seize chance to fight back to the mainland. Okay, that I'm, 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 I'm leaving that. And the other option actually is interesting, is to actually um, uh, to invade the Philippines and kick out the Spaniards. Uh, and then negotiate with the Qing Dynasty to turn Taiwan into a triple vessel, uh, in his own words, after the example of uh, uh, Korea and Rukyu, which is at that time an independent kingdom later become today's Okinawa after incorporated by Japan. So there's a vision of having a maritime uh, state uh, uh, based on trade revenues and have a peaceful coexistence with the chain continental empire. But it's one vision. The other vision is to actually to find an opportunity to fight back to the mainland and then uh, restore the Ming dynasty. So there's a two kind of a logic of power that they are torn between these two. That is one is a territorial continental imperial state and the other is the more VOC Dutch types of maritime uh, capitalist power. Uh, and so this is how the contingency came in. Uh, that is in the 1670s because the, the Zhang family monopolized all this trade and then the Qing Empire was stuffed of silver. So there was a huge depression as long as the Kangxi depression during the Kangxi Emperor in the 1660s and 1670s. So the, uh, the life is hard and the economy was crumbling. So in 1674 there was a rebellion starting in the south. Uh, uh, trying to topple the Manchus, who's not yet <coughs> quite consolidated the rule of all of uh, mainland China. Uh, but at that time, the, 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 the Jiang family, at that time, is already, the Jiang Jingkong already died, it's his son Jiang Jing, uh, who took charge, and then uh, uh, communicate secretly with all these rebels uh, in the south, and then so make a decision that turned out to be a fatal and very wrong decision to uh, mobilize all its forces and resources to fight back to China, uh, to try to restore the Ming dynasty. Um, and um, after um, five years of war, that uh, basically um, they have all manpower in the mainland fighting war, but uh, and then the trade route start to be crumbling. That they control the grip on the trade route start to crumbling, and the food um, source in uh, Taiwan also well, was um, uh, dwindling because so much was uh, used for the military campaign in the mainland. In the end, so the um, uh, and in the middle of the war, that some advisor of Jiang Jing already. Um, told him that it's better you draw from the mainland and consolidate the rule uh, and, and go out to really seriously invade the Philippines. And at that, at that time, the Spaniards heard about this uh, the possible invasion from the Jiang family from Taiwan and then they got panicked and think that all these uh, Chinese in Manila uh, cooperate with them. So it was uh, the, the impetus of one of the biggest massacre of Chinese in Manila, Manila because of this Spaniard fear of uh, the Jiang Jingkong uh, Jiang family's invasion. But anyway, the Zhang Jing uh, was stubborn and he, 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 he uh, stayed in the mainland, uh, didn't withdraw the troops until the whole regime in Taiwan collapsed. The original people and, and the, the, there's a mutiny and because of not enough of food and all this crazy thing happened and then uh, after that, uh, the one remaining surviving uh, uh, general defended to the Qing Dynasty and then uh, got the uh, Taiwan regime to surrender without a serious fight on the island. So it is how it ended. And after it ended, uh, the, the Jiang regime ended, they moved all the people back to mainland China and moved a fresh new wave of uh, mainland Chinese colonizers to colonize the farmland and things like that. And then uh, the Qing dynasty imposed ban on, not ban on trade, sea trade. They still allow people to do sea trade, but uh, they have a strict restriction on the size of the vessel. It cannot be too big. Uh, and they cannot carry arms on the ships. Uh, so basically it is to disarm the whole maritime zone that used to be controlled by the Zhang Empire. So here, uh, then it uh, connects us to the standard story. And then there was really a vacuum uh, in the maritime Asia. And when the European uh, came in full force and uh, the maritime area was already totally disarmed and vulnerable and then uh, was passively incorporated uh, by the Western imperialism. But it was not a kind of a predestined theological uh, result that it uh, involved the contingency that had Zhang Jing make a decision not to fight back to the mainland and stay and then follow the VOC 
model of state building uh, to build maritime <coughs> capital state. That would be another story. Then uh, the history of the incorporation of the Asian area um, uh, into the European system will be a very different form, of different pattern, and we would uh, see the Asian history of very different light today. But of course, this contingency, but also constrained by ideological force. In the end, it was this kind of a two model of state building. That is the imperial, dynastic, um, continental kind of uh, 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 ambition, and the European type of base, uh, state building. There's a maritime, trade-based, capitalist, uh, mercantilist state that they just learned from the Dutch, the German family. But uh, the latter one, the second mode of state building is not yet prevailed. So uh, in the end, that uh, the elite is still finding that it is more prestigious to have an empire and dynasty and continental state rather than a maritime state. So in the end, uh, they make the wrong decision. So let me stop here. So the story tells us is that this, uh, the incorporation of expansion of these networks and boundaries is more fuzzy and chaotic and uh, contingent than we thought it is never a strict, strictly structural and theological process. Thank you. Okay.